grief. There is deep within us, sparking a profound resistance to a life devoid of emotion. It emboldens wildness and flashes with the power of thunder while remaining untamed and free. As we learn, grief becomes the primary emotion for the soul's vitality. And grief, like love, embodies life itself. It resists being gentle and yet moves us so passionately, leaving no doubt this emotion erupts from the wells of our soul. In our podcast, we explore this defiance, embrace its wildness, and find peace within its untamed vitality as we live in the hustle of everyday life. Welcome to the Urban Grief Shamans. Join Patricia Jones, a psychotherapist, and John Moyer, a retired paramedic, as we explore the spiritual side of grief. In our episode today, you'll discover the powerful fusion of shamanic practice and clinical therapy in treating non-physical trauma, also known as PTSD. My guest, Alex Sullivan, shares first-hand experience, and together we explore the practical challenges and rewarding outcomes of merging spiritual practices with clinical approaches to trauma. Let's join in on my conversation with Alex. I have a concentration in group work which I did, I was told that the group workers were the fun ones in this program, <laughs> which I think was the case. We had some fun. But thinking again about shamanism, right? It's not something that's done in a solitary sense. It's something that's done in communities. A lot of my professional training is really in the idea of the circle, right? A therapy mm-hmm. group is a circle. And we're, we're sitting there and we're joined together. That hadn't really occurred to me until now, but it's there's a similarity there, I think. So when was that point that you thought that you would bring your shamanic practice and your clinical practice together? That was a challenge for me because, and you, know, you and I have talked about the chaos of, of insurance in the United mm-hmm. States. It's quite different from your experience in Canada, I think. But insurance companies want to pay for what they deem to be evidence-based allopathic medicine, which some of it is based on research and some of it is somewhat arbitrary. But working in agencies and working in nonprofits that are contracted with the state to provide these services, I found that there was a variety of openness to the administrations that I worked for in terms of bringing in these more shamanic practices, these more spiritual practices. I never experienced clients not being open to it, but I had to sneak things in a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I never really was able to do a healing session or anything like that in a treatment setting, which I would have loved to do. I think it would have been lovely. I think it would have been lovely to do things like drumming circles, to do singing and dancing. But it wasn't ever something I was able to do because I think it's not accepted. There's Um, some skepticism there. Is that if shamanism didn't fit the mold? I think it doesn't fit the mold. I think think psychology started very much as art. And then it swung into the direction of becoming science because there was such a push to get us recognized as mental health professionals and say, no, we're just as good as you doctors that treat infections and do surgeries and set bones. We do something that's just as important. And that's true. But where we've swung to is now everything has to fit this very specific mold of what it's supposed to look like. And I think we've lost the art of it. And when I say the art of it, I really mean the feeling aspect, the somatic aspect of being able to go where we feel guided with a particular person. And I think most therapists I know would say that, whether they think of it in a spiritual context or not, that sometimes we just have a feeling and we get pulled in a direction, ends up really opening up a new avenue. From a a healing philosophy uh, standpoint, How does your understanding of trauma differ when viewed through a shamanic lens compared to a psychotherapeutic one? I certainly have a merged view at this point, right? And I 
Yay. It's almost like I have two trains of thought going at the same time. It, and I really do try and honor if someone's coming to me for psychotherapy, I'm not going to inject shamanism when it's not asked for. Mm-hmm. I think that's rude. <laughs> <laughs> and vice versa. But when someone's coming to me with trauma and complex trauma is, is repetitive, early trauma is really the focus of my practice. I, you know, I, I do find myself thinking of it in terms of soul. Mm-hmm. And when I look at my training around trauma, most of which has been after my master's um, and in all the training, the hundreds of hours of training I've done around it, while they don't use the word soul, I, I think there really is not that much of a difference in terms of thinking about it, right? We talk about the self and the self concept and how does early trauma cause someone not to be able to have a cohesive sense of themselves. And so from a shamanic view, if we say this is soul loss, I think it really fits together quite nicely. And people will come in and say, I feel like I'm not whole. I feel like a piece of me is missing. And I don't think there's conflict in terms of thinking from a shamanic perspective, this is soul loss. And from a psychotherapeutic perspective, this is whatever we would call it. This is fragmentation. Whereas in a shamanic treatment would be a a soul retrieval, I guess in the traditional clinical side of things, it would be the, is it EMDR? Yeah. So, so I've maybe explain that for of, our listeners at EMDR is. Yeah. So, so I'll, 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 I'll explain it um, as, as best I can explain it all the time. So EMDR stands for eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. And it's different than talk therapy in that it's getting your brain to correctly process a memory that has not been correctly processed. So we think of the memory as being unprocessed in the sense that past trauma feels like it's still happening in the present. The memory is stuck and it's not processed or stored correctly. Mm -hmm. So with EMDR, what we're doing is using what we call bilateral stimulation, which can be eye movements from side to side. It can be tapping. It can be auditory. We're using that process to get the brain to process the memory correctly so it gets stored as long-term memory and what it does is it pulls out the negative emotion and the somatization that's attached to it that's so distressing um and it also through the way that we do it and set it up it can shift the belief that's attached to the memory so people tend to have core negative beliefs like it's my fault or I'm bad or I'm not safe Uh or I'm lovable. These deep beliefs that are hooked into all these different memories. And so a big piece of what we're doing is causing that to shift. I'm lovable. I'm okay the way I am. I can keep myself safe. Um, And with EMDR, it's really not a talk therapy. There doesn't have to be any talking at all. It's a way to get the brain and the body because it can really be quite somatic for people. It's getting, it's looking for a state shift. And so when I think of soul retrieval, people tend to experience something very similar that they really feel that something is different. And I think a lot of people think that the best they can do with trauma in any way, psychotherapeutically or otherwise, is learn to cope with it. And shamanism certainly teaches us that that we can do better than that. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the newer trauma therapies, not just EMDR, but things like sensory motor psychotherapy and and ego state therapy, which I have a lot of training in as well, show us that's not the case. We can do better than just cope with it when I feel triggered. Mm -hmm. Is it the sense that the trauma is stored in a particular part of the body or in the brain? Yeah. So one of the things we look at in EMDR is where do you feel this in the body? And some people tend to hold different things in different places. And some people have just a part of their body where they always feel that trauma. It's often in the core somewhere, in the heart or in the stomach. 
but people hold things in their arms. People will feel it move around the body, right? Mm -hmm. And and I found when you think about shamanic training, you would call that you would call that something else, right? Feeling something move around the body. Yes. You would call that an intrusion and you would remove it. Mm-hmm. Again, you see these parallels here. But what happens during EMDR is that there's an allowing, there, it allowing your body to release those things to shift within you. So when I think about it from a shamanic perspective, I don't know I would call it a spontaneous soul retrieval because it's not spontaneous. We were trying to do something. But the way I think of it is opening an invitation, mm-hmm. inviting that part to come back and creating an opening for that to happen. And often there's creating an opening for releasing. And I use a lot of metaphors with this and can go after it more directly sometimes. But can you feel that flowing out of your body? Can you feel a releasing in that part of your body? So I really do think something similar is happening. And I see people experiencing things not just at a mental level, but at a soul level, even though we're not talking about the soul. I understand. People have repetitive traumatic experiences. I'm thinking of my brothers and sisters in emergency medical services, policing and fire services, who have been carrying many different types of calls that they've experienced over perhaps their working career. And there's new traumatic experiences that are piling on. Would that be the right way to explain it or to suggest that how does one keep wrapping their bodies around this traumatic energy and not letting it go? And that's the thing with repetitive trauma, that there is a difference in experience between what we would call a single incident trauma, right? Mm -hmm. I've had a really good life, then I have this horrible car accident, and now I am experiencing PTSD from this one incident. And there's a difference between that and and a repetitive trauma, something that's happening over and over. It, it creates a different experience, and that's what we would call complex trauma. And folks that have that are experiencing complex PTSD, which is not an official diagnosis, there's a lot of debate around that and has been for years. But for complex PTSD, a lot of the time, it's repetitive childhood trauma. Mm-hmm. Because, and we talk about this shamanically too, how children have a foot in both worlds. So psychologically, children's sense of self is informed. We're not, we don't come out as infants with a full sense of self. So having those repetitive experiences as a young child can really distort your ability to look at the world as a safe place and look at yourself as a a person who is able to be in the world. Mm -hmm. And then thinking about first responders, it's, there's this similar thing of repeated trauma and it, this idea that it's inescapable, it keeps happening over and over. There's something to that inability to escape over and over that really compounds it. And I talk a lot about how trauma is cumulative. It's not these single separate incidents. It's that our brains are really good at finding patterns and they link these things together. And it can create really severe um, belief systems that make it very hard to be in the world in a healthy way. And other situations would certainly be like domestic uh, abuse or physical abuse. Anything that's uh, yeah, repetitive, exactly. uh, even in, for the nursing staff, uh, ER, military. People who have multiple griefs, is that similar? Because sometimes I wonder that when we talk about trauma, non-physical trauma, I see, because that's where Patricia and I have specialized merging grief awareness and shamanism. And, and I find that, it's, for, it's to me, it seems like it's one and the same that people who've had a lot of trauma and a lot of grief 
seem to have a lot of the symptoms that I hear when some of my colleagues expressing uh, their trauma stories. Any thoughts? Yeah, ab- absolutely. Uh, uh, you know, we, we talk about the difference between grief and traumatic grief. And there's this idea that there's, and I don't love the word appropriate here, but it's the word we tend to use. There's an appropriate grief process or a typical grief process. And I, I don't know anybody who, who really knows what they're talking about who would try and medicate away grief or therapize away grief, right? Supposed to feel it. But having multiple losses and even, again, coming back to first responders, witnessing a lot of death, and this applies to combat trauma as well, it, it creates this really profound... I, I just tend to describe traumas that are linked together, and this is just my metaphor, as a string of Christmas lights. They're all linked together, and you can't just light up one bulb, right? When you plug in, all the bulbs light up. And so when something reminds you of a trauma, it's not just that one trauma that gets triggered. It's the whole string of Christmas lights gets lit up. And so you get flooded with all of this emotion and all of this somatic sensation, and you might not get a whole series of memories. But what it is, all of those memories are lighting up. And so that's very true of grief, that these griefs can compound each other if you haven't gone through the process and if you haven't found, I I would say, found your peace with loss. I think that's something that we don't talk about a lot in our culture because we're so removed from death. We distance ourselves from it. It's not the way our ancestors would have had caretaking elders and then dying in the home and having grief rituals. And so much of that is gone. And so you can end up with this interrupted process. And that's what trauma is, right? It's an interrupted process of allowing your brain to complete the processing of a memory. And that happens with grief. We have these interrupted experiences that we don't get to grieve or we're discouraged from grieving or we don't have time to grieve. Maybe you don't have time. My my last employer would give you, I think, five days off of work for a parent and one day off for a non-parent, right? How could you possibly grieve in that time? Well, it's, and it's just like even yeah. in the first response communities, it's not enough to grieve in public or to, if you have a good partner, it gets you through so much. And if you don't have somebody that you trust or you feel safe with, then you're certainly not going to talk about the, your deeper feelings. And as the same through childhood shame or, or being in the grief of being rebuffed in a romantic situation. And these are all what we call perhaps the small griefs that we just suppress and we and we just keep building it up in ourselves. And one of the things I really loved about Weller's teachings was that unattended grief just becomes such like lead and it makes us numb. And so that we just don't do anything with it, but we don't live a full life. We don't live a big life. And then you have that big grief that comes along, like a death of somebody really close to you and it just takes you down. But what it does, the big one also opens up all the smaller ones and then you're being hit all at once with all these past memories. And it's very overwhelming. Right. And yeah, and psychologically, we call that flooding, which I it's, I think, such a lovely word for it in a way, because it's, think about getting knocked over by a wave. That's what it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you're making me think of so much of working with my folks who experience child abuse is dealing with things like abandonment and rejection. Mm-hmm. And those are they're severe, but it's not it's, so we don't think of it as a grief because you're not experiencing a death. And I think we've li- limited the word grief to a very specific huh. thing, not allowed it to encompass things like losing a job, losing housing, which, you know, it, I, I've had so many clients all of a sudden homeless, all of a sudden unemployed. What do we do with that? And you go into problem solving mode. And I'm certainly guilty of that because I want to fix it. I'm a problem solver. Right. So how can I house this person? How them income? How can I help them find food? But we have to remember that we have to deal with the grief of it. It's still a loss. Exactly. And it's not just loss of uh, place. It's also loss of, the. I, I don't know if you mentioned identity. 
who you are yeah. within that community. And all of a sudden you're thrust out of that. And now if you're trying to reestablish yourself in another place, you start from scratch sometimes, a lot of times, right? Absolutely. So coming back to trauma and the, you call it complex trauma, how would you take a, a shamanic approach to complex trauma? So complex trauma is extreme soul loss from a shamanic perspective. It's, it, and especially because it often starts when someone is so young, um, we're so vulnerable at that age from a soul perspective. And when you talk about that sense of identity, psychologically, we develop a sense of identity over time. And shamanically, when we're talking about the soul, our soul strengthens as we get older and as we learn ways to empower our soul. But children are vulnerable in many ways at, at a soul level, at a physical level. It's just a very vulnerable time. And we're dependent as children. We're dependent on our caregivers to survive. We wouldn't survive without them. And that's why it's so incredibly damaging when a caregiver is harmful because it's basically impossible for a child to reconcile that idea, I need this person to stay alive yes. and this person puts me at such incredible risk. And so we develop rejection and abandonment and attachment issues from that dichotomy that's just too much for a child to hold. And so looking at complex trauma from a shamanic perspective, it's a deep and profound level of soul loss. And it's soul loss for when I'm working with adults, because I work with adults, that's happened many years ago. And what happens then is we form our identities without those pieces of us. We can we can heal the trauma, we can do the soul retrieval, we can do the trauma psychotherapy, but then you're exactly right. We have this issue of, okay, who am I? Mm -hmm. If I have these soul parts returned to me, who am I now? Because I'm different and I feel different and I'm more whole and I'm more in myself, but it can feel very uncomfortable. And the same is true with trauma. If I suddenly have this belief that I'm worthy, what does that mean if I've lived my whole life like I'm unworthy? And so there's this whole piece of identity work that has to be done, I think, shamanically as well as therapeutically, in terms of what does this mean? How does this allow me to walk through the world now? It's really learning to walk again. Mm -hmm. It's almost like being a toddler because you haven't been in the world in this way. And it creates a whole different way of, of acting and of being. And when I see my clients who have been, so passive suddenly start to advocate for themselves. It's lovely. And it's why I do this work to see people start to do that, start to act like they deserve love and care. But then what happens a lot of the time is people around them are not expecting it and have these reactions. And then my folks don't know how to respond because they've never done it before. Uh -huh. They've never stuck up themselves before. It sounds to so, me like, I'm sorry, I cut you off there. I want no, you to go finish. Ahead, go ahead. I was going to say that when you mentioned that they just don't know how to find their place in the world or what they should do, it sounds to me like that's prime or they're prime for initiation or, or rituals to help them make that leap from who they were to not that they're, that they've grown, that they are different and they're living a different kind of life now, a life perhaps that they're closer to the kind of life that they were supposed to have. Do you think ritual would be a, a positive addition to their healing? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think a huge piece of this is the way community has shifted so dramatically, even in the last 50 years, right? My background is in um, addiction work and in particular in mandated addiction work, people who are involved in the legal system and something I don't know who initially said it. I don't even know if I could find that. But something we say a lot is that the op the opposite of addiction is not sobriety. The opposite of addiction is connection and the idea of feeling connected and being in community and being in circle. And it's such a huge piece of what is missing for so many people. And 
So I think initiation is a big piece of it. And I think in some ways a healing can be an initiation because you're coming out the other side somebody new. And healing is uncomfortable a lot of the time. And so it's there's this trial and tribulation and then this coming out the other side. But then who receives you? Right. And traditionally an initiation would be you into the community in a different way and you'd be embraced. And What I see a lot of the time is there's not this community to embrace. And I think that comes back to grief a lot, too. There's so many people who are put in this position of having to grieve alone. And so they just don't. And the grief doesn't happen. And so it stays stuck. But it's there's not this community to receive and to support. Yes. And I would even think that for many people, the, the family is not necessarily the best one to go back to. Uh, the family could have been a big problem for them to begin with. Exactly. Most of my folks are coming to see me because of trauma, at least partially, in their families of origin, if not exclusively. It's as we've retreated into this idea of the nuclear family, what do you do when your nuclear family is unhealthy? Who becomes your family? And I think about, I've been involved in queer and trans activism for over 20 years. And so I think about chosen family and how many people have gone to an event and felt like, oh, this is family. This is what it feels like. And the efforts that are made to create community when people have been rejected from their families. But I think in in our greater society, there's not an effort to do that. And as a result, people are without community and without that sense of family. There's not an easy solution for that one, building community, because it takes many people. It takes many people. And I think about how online we are. And I do online trainings and I've done online circles and I do online healing and online therapy and all of it. But it it's, I heard someone say at the beginning of the pandemic, when we were all doing this online, it's the we're reckoning with the presence of the person's absence. You can see the person in front of you, but they're not there. Mm -hmm. And as communities have gone online, I think there are a lot of ways that's positive because if you and your little small town can't find somebody who really gets you, you could probably find someone on the internet who gets you. And at the same time, what does that mean if you can't sit in a circle? And I'm just metaphorical using sort of shamanic language here, if you can't be in circle with people and have people in the room, have people embrace you, what does that do and how does that impact your sense of belonging and being in community? I agree with you. There is not an easy fix. And I don't even know if we're headed in a fixing type of direction with it. I know that uh, shamanic practices, when, when you think of First Nations people, they're deeply rooted in specific cultural traditions. And we just don't have to have that in the greater urban community. Yeah. And I think about my ancestors who came to the United States about 100 years ago, and they all settled in the same place because that's where the Eastern European Jewish community was. So that was community. And they all ended up right there in, in Patterson, New Jersey. And people have spread out and there's a lot more mobility and we feel less tied to a a, a place, not just to people, Mm -hmm. but a place. And thinking shamanically about community, that doesn't just involve people, of course. It involves the land and the spirits around us. And I just, I think there's so much that we're missing in terms of what is it to belong. What would, I agree that I I was going to follow up on that, that the since the specific cultural traditions are tied to a community. And so when people, I was wondering, how do you ensure cultural sensitivity and respect in your own practice to with your clients? I know the answer because I know you, but I was wondering if you have a thought for that. <laughs> yes, I have a thought for that. So I always ask about that. I always ask about culture. And that that's my training. And as a social worker, I have to get cultural competence continuing education credits every year and different states have different requirements, but there's a certain number of my units that have to be related to cultural competence. But my training is to ask about this. I think a lot of people skip it because it makes them feel uncomfortable, but I think it's important. 
And I think about my own traditions and what grief rituals look like for us. And and we have specific grief rituals and, and people continue those specific grief rituals in a way that that a lot of cultures don't. And I'm, I'm really very thankful for the grief rituals that I've been involved in that way and that I know and have been taught to me. Also, I, I think that there's a rooting in ancestors and culture. And even if family of origin is unhealthy, when I'm not someone who says, oh, you should always keep the door open to your parents. No, sometimes you shouldn't. Mm-hmm. And I don't ever tell anybody what to do. And I say that. I say, I can't tell you whether to keep talking to your father or not. It's, he's not my father. It's not <laughs> my life. That's your call. We could talk about it, but I'm not going to tell you what to do. But I think there can be a rooting in ancestors and culture. Mm-hmm. Even if the immediate family of origin is not healthy for you. So I and I've certainly found that myself as I've deepened my own shamanic practice and and my shamanic training is core shamanism. I've trained with traditional shamans in in a couple of different traditions, but I, I would still say I'm a core practitioner because that's really where I'm rooted. But I've integrated a whole lot of traditions from my own culture and my own ancestry. And my ancestors have taught me how to do things in different ways, including things I haven't seen documented anywhere necessarily, or they've taught me things. And then years later, I hear about it or I read about Mm -hmm. it and I say, oh, I I do that. So I think there's a rooting in a community with our unseen family that, that can really be very healing. So shamanically it's something i i talk about a lot because ancestors are yes a big part of my practice and a particular interest of mine but i think there's something to be had there not just shamanically in terms of rooting in culture and what helps you feel rooted and what helps you feel resourced Mm -hmm. can you just explain the core shamanism for our listeners sure so core shamanism originated with Michael Harner in, I'm going to say, early 60s. I can't remember the exact date that the Foundation for Shamanic Studies was formed at the time. I think it was, it was in the, the 70s, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, it was the Society for Shamanic. It was, some, it was something else oh. in the beginning. Founded in Norwalk, Connecticut. Fun fact, not far from me. And core shamanism is the universal, near universal, and common principles and practices of shamanism worldwide together with the shamanic journey, which is a common feature. And so what it is, it's not taking specific cultural practices from different places and trying to knit them together because that would be, I would say, ineffective at best. Mm -hmm. What it is is looking at globally what typical to shamanic practice and shamanic culture And using those practices as a way to get in touch with your own helping spirits. So it is a tradition, even though it's quite a young tradition, it has a lineage to it, even though it's a young lineage. But what it is for is it gives access for people that don't have a shamanic tradition that they're connected to in their culture and their community. It gives those folks a way to access compassionate helping spirits so that they can do the work. And it's, I I think it's such a wonderful thing for us to have because I can't go be a Mongolian shaman or a Peruvian shaman because I'm not Mongolian and I'm not Peruvian and I'm not immersed in that culture. And I could go live there for 40 years, but I still would have at least pieces of the worldview from the upbringing Mm -hmm. I received. So we can't just become of another culture. And so what core shamanism gives us is a way to engage our own helping spirits and our own culture in order to be able to do this work in a really deep and powerful way. That was well said. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Can you tell I've said it before? (laughs) Maybe once or twice. I just wanted two questions that I'd like to just focus on next is I was just wondering, do you have a case study that you could present without it, any identification, excuse me, identification? And then following up on that, I'll let you 
I'll let you handle that one first. Are you looking for Are you looking for some positivity, or, or do you not care? Just uh, something that's real that for our listeners can see an individual and what was the outcome that was good, or how you <laughs> applied that. And I think so that it's if some people are a little bit cynical listening to the show or to not quite getting it, that an example okay. of what takes place. So I'll give you I'll give you a therapy client. This is a sad one, unfortunately, but she came in to work on traumatic grief. She had lost a child and we were doing EMDR and she was feeling very stuck with it. And I became aware as we were doing it of of the spirit of child in the room. And I'm not someone who normally sees. That's not how I usually mm -hmm. perceive. But I could see the outline of this spirit and, you know, sort of started to receive and I'm pretty auditory. So I started to engage in conversation and I could hear the child say things. And then she would say, I'm imagining him saying and it was the same thing that he had just said to me. And it was what, what was so sad is that she just couldn't let him go. And so they were tied together. And she just, at, at the time I saw her, she just wasn't, she wasn't ready. She was still holding him. Mm -hmm. And it was really sad because I can't make her, I can't make her let him go. But it just, it kept her in this really very grief stricken place. And I don't, in therapy and in shamanism, I don't force people to do things. That's not how I work. I know it's not how you mm -hmm. work. But it was, I, I wasn't looking for this spirit. It, it just all of a sudden there he was. And I hope that she can find a way to relax the holding enough for him to be able to go where he needs to go. But it, it was just very sad. There was a lot of sadness for me because... I felt like I had, I felt like I had two clients because I had my therapy client, but then I also had this spirit in the room. I know that's not a fun, uplifting one, but it's, it was clear as day. There he was. Well, now, do you have a, something specifically, a story related to what they would call a, more of a, a clear traumatic experience and how you worked with that client? Uh, yeah, I actually, I have a psychopop story if you want to hear it. Okay. So I, I work, I did a lot of addiction work and I was working in an intensive outpatient program for folks who were early in their recovery. And as a result, we had a lot of people relapsing and opioid addiction is the most lethal mental health diagnosis. And so I've, I have lost people and it's really hard. And I know every loss feels different, but I, in my intensive outpatient, the folks I, my colleagues and I lost someone and it, it was a really hard one. He was a younger guy. He was in his 20s and he had overdosed and we weren't sure if it was intentional or not, but it was just, it was really hard. It was a really hard loss. And so I felt sorry for myself for a little while. And then I said, I'm going to go, I'm going to go find him. I was the self-designated agency psychopomp at the time. And so I, I went to look for him and he was very stuck, but he was stuck because he didn't think you'd go to heaven. And I, of course, that's a result of trauma, right? Like I, I'm bad, so I can't go anywhere because oh, sure. I have to stay here, right? And so helping deceased people is really so much like therapy because it's the conversation and it's figuring out what's the way forward. So I feel very much like a therapist when I'm doing that kind of work. Mm -hmm. And he was, but what I had to explain to him, which sort of, I think, relates to the, the other story, is that you, you can't be there for your family this way. You can't be helpful to them this way. But if you're able to get where you need to go, then you can be helpful to them. Mm -hmm. and you can, then you can be an ancestor. Then you can be of assistance. And so he was able to move on. And I was doing psychopomp, I don't know, maybe three years later. And I bubbed into him and he was, he was, oh, good to see you. And it was really very sweet. He was, he was a sweet guy when he was alive. Um, 
But I think it's so important for us to realize how dying with unresolved trauma, it's not like the death just resolves it. No. And the more trauma you have, the more soul loss you have, the more likely you are not to have the power to be able to really move on. And so I think about what I would call an epidemic of soul loss in our society, and it creates all these other issues because we have all these names for little kinds of cultures, the hungry ghosts or, or mm-hmm. what have you, that just can't move on, can't get where they need to go. Just to bring it back to those who are still walking on this earth, I was just thinking, so for example, anybody who's who feels as if they've been had a traumatic experience, been threatened with a gun, whatever, if it's first time, how would you, what steps would you recommend in the short term for them to engage in to help to ensure that they won't be a victim of trauma? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And, and there's some interesting new research. You're going you're gonna to love this. Playing Tetris. <laughs> well, true story. There's a new study out that playing Tetris um, reduces the likelihood that an acute trauma is going to turn into PTSD. And from an EMDR perspective, it's that you're working your brain while you're thinking about the trauma. And so it gets the memory to move through through your brain, through the process. So all the EMDR therapists I know said, oh, of course that works. But that's the new research. And that's a pretty easy one to go ahead and download Tetris on your phone. So I like that. (laughs) But I think where people get stuck is the trying not to think about it. Yes. And sometimes it's so intense that you really can't think about it and you need to distract yourself. But and Francis Weller talks about this in his book, I'm sure you've talked about on the show before, because you're the one who recommended it to me, the importance of actually feeling our feelings. And there's so many people who are so deeply fearful of feeling feelings that, that you know, and, are, and we're pretty good. Our brains are pretty clever. We can box things away, but they don't ever really stay boxed. They're still there. And that's when sometimes the box gets bumped and open and we get that flooding being able to feel feelings and work through it. And I really encourage people not to try and reinvent the wheel. Many people have ways that work for them of feeling feelings, whether that's journaling, whether that's talking to somebody, whether that's drawing it or whatever Mm -hmm. it is. Um, Our brains want to process things, right? We dream about them. We get stuck in them. Our brains are trying to process. So if you can allow yourself to actually experience the emotion, sometimes that's what's needed. But also I I encourage people not to wait until 20 years later when they've been suffering to get some help with it, whether it's therapy or shamanism or sacral or acupuncture or tai chi, whatever Mm -hmm. kind of modality feels good to you. It's not too early to talk about it. You, when you first experience trauma, we expect you to feel all those symptoms of what it, we would call acute stress disorder. We don't diagnose PTSD until six months after the trauma because those symptoms in the beginning are appropriate. That's our brain and our body releasing the experience. But if it feels debilitating, if you feel like you can't leave the house, you can't go to work, you're constantly overwhelmed, it's not ever too early to get some help with it. And as a therapist and as a my practitioner, I, I'm very relational. I work in a relational way. And a lot of the time, just having somebody else to witness your experience can be so deeply healing. It brings me back to community and the idea that we're in this place in our society where we're just expected to go through these things alone. And I think finding a way not to be alone, finding a way to be witnessed often is really the best thing. That's a, an important pillar for attending a, a grief circle. It's not from, you don't, have to be, think of it as that I lost my wife or my child or whatever might be big for you. and But to come in and talk about your call at work or to talk about um, a, a threatening event that took place on the street with you or a car accident that you're in, these are just as big as it's like personal grief 
And and the grease circles don't, many are free, others charge a small amount just to help cover costs. But yeah, and it's that witnessing, as you say, that is so important, is the sharing of whatever your grief story is. And I might have mentioned it on another show that people that, that come to a grief circle to talk about just even the loss of a species or a loss of, loss of a beautiful uh, uh, grove of, of trees that was taken down to be replaced by, by homes. Uh, a lot of people care very deeply for these things and they grieve deeply. Uh, sharing uh, and having your, your pain witnessed and your story heard in a safe, non-threatening environment is big. Just to plug our own little thing on the soulful sorrows, uh, we have uh, monthly grief circles and we invite uh, anybody and everybody who feels that they uh, would benefit by being witnessed to uh, come. It's uh, the third uh, Tuesday of uh, each month. Anyways, Alex, I think I we should leave it there. <laughs> And uh, like always, I just, I get such joy speaking with you and, uh, and certainly appreciate deeply your thoughts today. So for the show notes, we will definitely be following up on Tetris and <laughs> other resources. I found uh, Paul Levine's book, Waking the Tiger, mm -hmm. was a good place to start with. And uh, what I got out of that was that our bodies just want to heal. They know how to heal if we get out of their way. Yes. And just let our bodies not do what they know best. Anyways. I totally agree. Thank you, Alex. And we'll speak again. Thanks so much, John. It's been lovely to chat with you. As we wrap up today's episode, we've explored approaches blending shamanic traditions and clinical therapy for a holistic healing approach to trauma and grief. Thank you to our guest, Alex Solomon, for sharing their insights on merging shamanic wisdom with psychotherapies. Please continue this conversation by leaving your thoughts on this episode in the comments section below or email me at john at urbangriefshamans.com. Until we meet again, may your journey be filled with beauty and balance.